La 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 la. Ah, the water's there. I'm not going to go near it. No one's allowed to breathe. Hold your breath for 20 minutes. Please. <laughs> I don't know if it's worth it. There's a joke that works if it's on this machine and doesn't work quite as well if it's not. Um, You can all go in. You can all leave at any time, but actually don't, because you make the thing flicker. But there's only 20 minutes of me to put up with at worst. Um, I hate listening to myself, and I'm right in front of myself. Hey, this is really. <laughs> there's no feedback. <laughs> well, whatever it is, it do don't breathe. Um, it works well. Yeah, nines was flickering. We've tried bloody hard to get this thing flickering. It's curious <laughs> that it's actually happy, uh, ish, <laughs> ish. Uh, um, I think that's 1080p. Oh, it's the same yeah. Yes, that's what the guy has said, and it's some. The, he gave me the name of the protocol, and I don't know whether we're still renegotiating or whether we've forced the the little blighter into anything. Um, based on playing on the hotel TV with this thing, th I've got two SD cards bootable. The other one, I think, is constrained to run at 720p because Andrea's TV is a lovely thing. N uh, the negotiation goes, can I do 1080p? No, says the TV. Can I do... Yes, says the, t the TV. I can do 1080i. Excellent, says the Raspberry Pi. We'll do 1080i then. Of course, the telly is downscaling to 720p and there's no menu option on the telly to stop lying. <laughs> so I have to tell the Pi, no, don't... Whatever, max out at 720p. Not that I'm allowed to use the TV very much as the console because I have to unplug the HDMI for the that sat thing and it's not my TV and uh, uh, not that it gets turned on much. Um, I'm yes blathering partly to try and keep myself calm and partly. It's not working. No, I'm not calm. <laughs> <laughs> lock the door. Is there anyone outside? Actually, yes. Lock the. Well, that's a very silly idea. Which pocket? I've got the key at the moment. <laughs> ha. Could you pass that? I'm not going to throw it, and I'm not going near that bloody cable. Uh. Good start. Right. Oh, great. Here we go. Um, so, yes. Let's see how this goes. The title is Lying in a Field Stargazing. Um, and... Well, this was I suddenly realised that um, the in Douglas Adams' inspiration for Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy was that he was lying in a field, lying in a field, gazing at the stars, thinking about all the, I believe it was Germans, going on holiday, ho holiday to Italy through Austria. And great, and actually, I didn't quite get it right. I thought, well, we should do it because, well, actually, he was in Innsbruck and we we're in Salzburg, so sorry about the error there. Um, 200 clicks off. I shall stop moving. Um, also, I shall present many things in here which I put this talk together from memory, so things may be wrong. Actually, I can't remember the disclaimer that there's a chunk of this talk that is certainly my opinions. There's some things that I think are facts that I have confused from my opinions, and um, there's a whole bunch of uh, potential errors in it. So please don't throw too many rotten things. Um, yes, a chunk of this stuff does need citation needed. If you're watching me on YouTube and you can find an error, citation needed or it didn't happen. Uh, which reminds me of my YouTube fans. Yes, hi Dom. Um, <coughs> um, um, it's also, I think, nine years since I last did a talk, so this may not be very good. Um, and the slide presentation goodies I used at that time was something like Axe Kit, which has been in the Apache attic for, well, that tells you how long. <laughs> um, and I'm probably still talking too fast. And yes, the bad news is the stargazing in this is actually astrology rather than astronomy because it's kind of trying to predict the future. But if I got the good news, yes, uh, um, there's only one version of this talk. We won't split you up into 12 groups and give you 12 different talks and keep some of you waiting for ages. <laughs> so it's not that bad. And the spoiler about the end of the talk, you can leave now because the answer is I don't know. But we'll take you to the don't know. Um, uh, which is kind of the point of the talk. Uh, yeah, so what about the props? Well, the Douglas Adams reference, there's no T. I tagged it as T, that's cheating. The other talk really has T. Um, um, the towel, yes. Um, the towel, Douglas Adams jokes about towel. It was uh, Fred Perry won Wimbledon, the men's championship in 36. No one really would have predicted that it took 77 years until um, the next male champion at Wimbledon, British, that is. Um, and uh, the back print on the T-shirt is the imaginary Pugs timeline, which is also not turning out to be a particularly good um, prediction of the future. 
I don't know if you can read it, but I think it ends in 2007 with happiness. Um, <laughs> and yeah, as to <laughs> yes, um, and the field. Well, there's this saying in English about the grass is always greener on the other side of the fence. So it's kind of, and as Kermit would say, it's not easy being green. So this is kind of a look at how is the other side of the fence, how are other people's fields doing? Well, Tickle, start with Tickle because it's the easiest. Tickle is way ahead of the game of Pearl, or, or, of Pearl on this game. Um, tickle really isn't used for very much anymore. I understand that it's Redis Test Suite and Mac ports have recently used Tickle, but that's about it. And I believe that um, O'Reilly's sales of books for Said and Orc uh, crossed over above, or Tickle crossed below, some years ago. So I think that kind of says it, and we won't talk about Tickle anymore. Um, PHP. See, these are all opinions dressed up as facts. Um, well, the curious one is Hip Hop Virtual Machine, Facebook's second generation of, of an alternate virtual machine for hip hop, JIT, pretty cool. Um, and there's a spec for PHP now. That's awesome. Curious bit is it's written by Facebook as well. And it has opt-outs in a bunch of places that allows places that allow HHVM PHP to be equally correct as Zend PHP, despite the fact they behave differently. Hmm. Um, and so Zend are getting to the point of PHP 7, the next PHP. And I read this blog post where they were going, for some things, it's faster than HHVM. Why are you saying that? Why is this important to you? And it's sort of maybe that Facebook's dumping or whatever on Zen's, well, Zen's business model is selling fast PHP, and Facebook's giving it away for free. Um, there's also the HHVM future of PHP is not PHP 7, it's Facebook's hack language. So what is the migration for PHP? What's going to happen next to them? Is it going to fork? Are people going to go to hack rather than PHP 7? In particular, if it turns out that Facebook's engineers are much better and uh, HHVM has fewer CVEs, will that be the direction most people take? So it's not obvious what their future is. Um, Ruby. Well, there's uh, the active things. Um, there's Ruby, JRuby, and Rubinius. Great. But curiously, um, Ruby, or Matt MRI, or Yav, um, and Rubinius are on Ruby 2.1, but JRuby is still on 1.9. And Ruby's refinements are less than awesome. Um, and there was this whole Ruby is dead post from the author of Rubinius, which was misinterpreting the data. Well, it was relative decline in use of Ruby is not death. But somehow he misinterpreted this as death, so he's making a fork of Ruby called Rubinius, or he's talking a lot about it. Not much code visible yet. So it is a fork. He's saying he's going to do better concurrency in it. Watch that word. It comes up later. But is Ruby going to fork? And the numbers game was interesting. Uh, let's see if I can actually find these babies. I downloaded these when I had a net intentionally when I had a network. Yeah, Ruby gems. Uh, displaying gems. I mean, there's a big thing in the front about how many zillion downloads it's got. And if I've got history, I might even ha Oh, no, that's going to try and do that. OK, there's the thing that matters. Um, actually, when you dig through, there's only about 5,600 gems, which is curious, because CPAN I looked earlier, I think it was 11,000. It's not so important. Um, the fun one is PyPy, the Python package index. There's more than one PyPy. There it is in bold. Let's zoom this up. This was scaled for the previous resolution we were trying. Sorry about the blinks, but the joke is worth it later. Almost f uh, 50,000. Uh, so on the numbers game, it sure looks like Python is winning. Um, and it's kind of curious, yeah, whatever number was yesterday when I built these things. The, the client for PyPy, so Andreas's CPAN client has been bundled with Perl 5 forever, basically. Py Python didn't bundle its packaging client until mid 2.7, and they're well ahead. Well, so, yeah, is, is Python winning? Python, yeah, well, it's certainly ahead of the game on migration compared with Perl 6. But uh, Python 3 was released five years ago, and the uptake of Python 3 is only about 3% of total Python usage by various metrics. Basically, the problem is Python 2 is already too damn awesome. Um, yeah. And Python 3 still has a global interpreter lock. So, yeah, well, there is PyPy, the other one, Python re-implemented in Python, and they're intending to do concurrency with software transactional memory. Um, but is this really a viable concurrency strategy? I mean, I've had chats with Jonathan, and Jonathan certainly backs me up. Software transactional memory is great when you're inside the same process, but it relies on the idea that you speculatively do some code, and if the world changed while you were doing it, you go, oh, bother, undo, 
try again with the revised world. That works as long as you can undo, but as soon as you send data around a socket or you talk to a database or you send a, you can't undo that. It's not a viable concurrency strategy outside of one process. And oh, even better, they're still doing it. It makes Rakudo look production ready. <laughs> But anyway, is PyPy even the winner, given that there's Piston, an, uh, an alternative Python JIT? Piston's basically said, well, PyPy is using a tracing JIT strategy, and that all the JavaScript stuff stopped going tracing and went method JITs five years ago. Method JITs are how things are going to work better. Well, so maybe it's JavaScript who's winning. Uh, okay, so on the server, you're not really talking JavaScript. I will, yeah, big disclaimer. We're definitely talking Node.js here, not JavaScript. So one subset of JavaScript. And Node.js, well, yes, yeah, so there's this hacker's dictionary comment about C. C is a language that combines all the elegance and power of assembly language with all the readability and maintainability of assembly language. <laughs> yeah. Node.js, it always feels like, I'm close to the metal. Here comes the, no, almost there. They are mis mistaking effort for achievement. Oh boy, they are. So like, as a good side, it has excellent APIs, and I'm told it's excellent for asynchronous streaming where you're piping through from another service. Yeah, cool. That is good. I, the APIs are really brilliant. Uh, you end up in a callback hell. Um, it's also cooperative multitasking. Uh, it too, and I've been told by someone who knows this stuff to scale across multiple CPUs, like modern servers, multi-core, multi-CPU. You run one vhost per CPU. Hey! The cooperative multitasking on a single core. <laughs> Welcome to the 1990s. <laughs> and for the benefit of everyone watching this, this is a Raspberry Pi. Yeah, this is not the future. Because what matters is concurrency. Basically, Moore's Law, the prediction that I think strictly the revised version is the number of transaction, transact. I got this wrong when I practiced it as well. Transistors, those things. Um, Stop moving. Me. Um, doubles for the same cost in 18 months or something anyway. Yeah, well, it's getting middle-aged spread. We're no longer getting faster. We're getting more cores. We've already got to the point where phones are available with eight cores. Um, we have 24 so core servers now. They're kind of de rigueur. Um, and if you keep on going with Moore's Law, um, there'll be 192 core servers in five years. This just follows. There'll be 3,000 cores in 10 years. It's logical extrapolation of what's happening. So who's going to win? And I say it's none of the above. At least none of the above are obviously going to win because none of them. There's no decent concurrency in the reference implementation of any of those things I've just mentioned previously. And it's not like Perl five is going to either because well yeah iThread's great sorry, and I can promise you this that even if you figure out all the awkwardness about iThread's um, for the and you move, for example, to a message passing paradigm where you have separate interpreters passing messages rather than the current shared memory attempts. The startup costs of spinning out all those other interpreters mean you are not going to get, well, like the stuff Jonathan demonstrates this morning of, oh, I got some work, fan to five, fan to some number of cores. So you're never going to fix that with iThreads either. Um, and whilst Rubinius and I believe the .NET and JVM implementations of Ruby and Python have good concurrency because they were built that way, it's not clear how good they have, they have concurrency, how, whether the primitives are too low, too, low, too low level. And for that matter, whether your Ruby code for Rubinius concurrency is going to work if you try and run it on Iron Ruby or JRuby. So it's not clear that they've got this one right either. Now think, code you write at work or anywhere today, code lasts much longer than you want it to. Something you're writing today may well last five years, possibly 10. What did I say? 192 core servers? 3,000 core servers? It could well be that code you write today, or Monday when you go back, or Tuesday for the hackathon, could end up in the, in, within its lifetime only using 1% or 0.1% of the available CPU resource because it's single core, single thread. Uh, and that's not going to win because you need something that can fan out to all those CPUs. So if they're not going to win, well, what is? Well, is Go, Google's Go, hmm, Scala? Erlang, Perl 6, uh, there's no production of Perl 6 yet, so when that happens, it'll be playing catch up. Um, but it's close. Well, none of the above. Um, well, I don't know. I do know a bit about Scala. Uh, that was one of my disclaimers. I, most of the things I haven't used, this is observation. It's certainly trendy. Um, 
it's tied to the JVM. That's probably both a good and a bad thing. JVM's got excellent amount of optimizations done for it, but um, they were making design decisions that are compromised to go on the JVM. I think it, it, JVM generics throw information away and Scala can't rely on that. Jonathan, if you can nod. Yes, thank you. Um, go, Google's Go. Well, it's certainly fun. People seem to be enjoying using it, which is a good thing. Um, the bit I find a bit strange about it is it elected to go for UTF-8. That's a variable with encoding. It's basic primitive for how to deal with characters is UTF-8, just like the Perl internals. UTF-8 is an excellent encoding for transfer between systems, but it's not really a good encoding for your internal representation because um, it makes some things unpainful because it's ON, and if you're starting to do graphemes, you're talking ON squared because you have to do an ON operation for each to go from how many bytes in this code point and then you collate um, um, code points into graphemes, which is another ON operation, so we're talking ON squared. It's, hmm. Also, it has no exceptions, which is probably actually a good design decision for a systems programming language, which is what I believe Google's intent with it. Um, but what are its actual users? They seem to be, well, I don't think many people here are writing systems stuff, or anybody. It's people doing things like us, websites, um, <laughs> we had the bioinfo stuff, all that, and maybe exceptions should be needed. I don't know. So kind of my in conclusions, oh, I forgot that one of my browser windows, you've got this other fun thing, just, yeah, the dead batteries included, and I've seen similar articles for Ruby, that basically the problem is that if Python is sitting on 2.7 and most people are using 2.7, um, the standard library is stale and old. It's true of Ruby, it's true of Perl 5. Um, that is another interesting not going to win problem. Oh, sorry, I forgot that, but I managed to open the tab. I'm out of order. I told you it wasn't going to work perfectly. So it's obvious that there's a problem that it seems, blah. it's just not obvious who's going to win. This is kind of a problem. Um, I think it is obvious that there's a known unknown. I have a meta level confidence that I'm not confident about this. Um, this is where I'm going to get surprised by my slide. Oh, not good. Clearly, it's, it, I feel it's clear, it's unclear how things, it's clearly unclear how things are going to pan out. Um, this is kind of bad news if your idea was, well, you want to learn one language, I'm an X programmer, and your idea is to figure out, well, what's going to be the new X, and pick that as my career, as I'm this, and this is it. Uh, this is not a good strategy at the moment, because it's not clear what language you should be using. You're not a good programmer if you only use one language either, or only know one language. But anyway, I'm pretty confident that is a really bad idea at the moment. The good news, as I can put it, is, well, the best way to predict the future is to create it, which allegedly is attributed to Peter F. Drucker. I have no idea. But, um, and really, this is the last... It seems to be a good time to be creating the future, because nobody else has already won, at least not obviously. And so, yeah, that's my don't know. I guess um, the end, questions. <laughs> oh god, I scared everybody. <laughs> well, it will be online. There'll be a whole lot of comments about things. Citation needed to correct me. Actually, I can fill in a bit. Yerd gave, when I sort of gave the spin of this to him a bit ago, said a different contradiction is for, for devices like that, which, for embedded stuff, have way, way more power than the 16 or 8-bit machines that went previously. Things like Perl 5 are just fine. That's Perl that thing has more than enough grunt to run Perl 5 to act as a microcontroller for your coffee machine or whatever else you embedded it into. So at that level, there isn't a problem with concurrency. There's a new use case. And yes, he may be right, but the other kind of side of it is, why would you learn one language that's valuable for those sort of things and then a different language for your day jobs? sort of thing, and mm, I'm not confident about that. I can't see why there's going to be zillions and zillions of languages in the same ecosystem, because I think the ones that have the concurrency are going to win, because they're the natural fit for some things, and that as long as the cost of the concurrency is not painful, they're just as good for the small devices like that, or their successors. Uh, there's some nodding from Max that makes me think I'm not being stupid, or maybe Max is a... <laughs> anyway. <laughs> that was the unquestioned from Yerd, who is not here. Hi, Yerd. Um, I really have scared everybody, and I think I'm under time, which is really weird. Because officially I'm 20 minutes. Next talk? Next talk. Let's see if I can shut this thing down properly, not that it matters.
I try, yes. <laughs> well, also, yes, um, yes, this is my native language and I was trying to be slow. <laughs> I'm sorry if I wasn't, which I don't think I was. <laughs> um, right, yeah, next victim. Thank you.